Hey everybody, welcome back, another Gravity Ace devlog, kind of late on a Friday night, but uh, I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> uh, that's a bummer, that's not so bad. Seems like we've been in quarantine forever. I wouldn't mind going out for beer though, what are you going to do? Um, so today, I do have a slight to-do list. Some of this stuff came from the, the beta test that I'm doing right now. Uh, let me talk about that for a minute. Hey, everybody. Hey, Patrick, Fox Shadow, Annie Key. Welcome back, folks. Um, yeah, so I, I started a beta test, um... I guess Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Um, I don't really expect a lot of folks to get into it until the weekend. You know, people have jobs and stuff, but I've gotten some feedback already. Uh, some of it really great. Um, I tend to, I don't know. Nobody likes getting criticism, right? Putting stuff out there is tough. And one of the I don't know, one of the, you, you kind of have kind of a thick skin, I guess, to put stuff out there. Probably the best, uh, so I tend to like, I'll, I'll do a test like this, I'll put it out there, and then I'll tend to just ignore it for a while. Um, I'll poke my head into the chat, but not really, you know, I have a Discord server where people are commenting and stuff, but I'll tend to not poke my head in there too much. Uh, my level designer, Peter, he's in there uh, a lot looking at stuff. But, I don't know, my heart can't take it. It's too much. I need to, like, just wait a couple of days. I'll probably check it on Monday. Um, but I have, I have looked in there. I've watched one gameplay video that someone recorded for me, my friend Max, who's working on uh, flockofdogs.com. And, um, yeah, it's been good. Um, I think the feedback so far has been encouraging. One thing I try to do with these things is remember, like the best advice I've gotten, or not personally gotten, but the best advice I've ever heard about taking criticism is, um, I've, I don't remember who said it, but it goes something like, um, when people say there's something wrong, they're probably right. But when they tell you how to fix it, they're probably wrong. Um, so I've got some work to do on fixing things. Um, but I'm not sure what it is yet. Uh, there are a couple of things that I want to fix. Uh, one of them is uh, there's some bugs, right? Some bugs are pretty obvious. Uh, this one actually came to me in a dream. <laughs> there's, a, there's a problem where... Um, so the tractor beam sometimes will... It has two phases, right? It's, got, it's like a two-stage tractor beam. The first stage of it is it can change in length. But once it gets to a certain length, then it goes rigid and it won't compress anymore. And what's happening is when you beam up people, they beam up very quickly. But sometimes they'll hit that perfect length, that perfect distance where it makes the beam rigid. And instead of getting... <laughs> yeah, I'm very talented. Instead of getting pulled into the ship, they just kind of push it. Um, but... So I was, I was falling asleep and I was just, I was going off to dreamland and then I just, it hit me of why that bug was happening and it has to do with the two stage track to be in the distance and I just sat upright and I came downstairs and wrote this. Um, I think it's a pretty easy fix. So uh, let's get into that real quick and I'll show you guys how the uh, two stage tractor beam goes. Hey, <laughs> Patrick. Hey, man. No, be uh, be brutally honest. Uh, maybe not brutal, but be honest. I can take it. I can take it. And I know any feedback you give me uh, comes from a place of, uh, of uh, love and helpfulness. So it's fine. <clears throat> um... <laughs> 
Yeah, it's tough though, right? Putting yourself out there and getting like creatively and and tr you know asking people to judge you basically. Here's a thing I made. What do you think about it? And they're judging the game, right? But really they're judging you because you made it. It's just hard. Uh, it gets easier. It's easier now for me than I, it used to be. I used to curl up into a ball and annoy my family for two weeks. And now I just mope around the house for a couple of days. It's better. My wife might argue with that. So the tractor beam is, <laughs> it's sort of complicated. It's not, it's not terrible, but it is sort of complicated. Let me show you. In the ship, and I'm wearing this ridiculous hat and I'm not used to it. Twitch loves hats though, right? What do you guys think of the hat? Um, so there's a two stage tractor beam. Like I said, stage one, it, it attaches to the target, but then it doesn't start, um, it has a length to it, right? A maximum distance. And only once it hits the maximum distance will it start, uh, will it go rigid and start pulling the thing that it's attached to. Uh, when it's within that minimum distance, if it's shorter than that minimum distance, you can kind of move around and it has some slack in it. So the way that works is there's a, Oops, there's a toggle tractor function. And so this is what gets called when you activate the beam. And uh, what it does is it just goes to the closest beamable thing. Yeah, try not to take it personally, right? <laughs> yeah, and there will be letters going boom. Uh, so uh, it, it finds the closest beamable thing, gets a reference to it. And then um, if that closest thing, if there is a closest thing to be beamed and the tractor beam is not active, then it tries to connect the tractor beam to it. This is a Boolean, got him. And uh, if it did get him, this is just some complicated like uh, UI UX stuff, right? If if this is this this toggle basically this variable basically um, the way it was what was happening before was if you held down the control to activate the beam, it would turn on and off really fast. And this just says if you got something, then don't toggle don't allow the beam to be toggled off right away. So it gives it like I don't know some there's some timeout very short timeout so you have time to release the button and it doesn't turn it off. That's what that Boolean's about. Then it plays, uh, if it didn't connect to anything, it plays the fail sound effect. And if the beam was already active, then it turns it off. So in tractor, well, actually, first of all, let's find out how does it, how does it find the closest beamable thing? So there's a uh, timer in the ship um, tractor timer, and that's running every half a second. No, tractor target timer, that's running every tenth of a second. And every tenth of a second it calls this method where it just searches for the closest beamable thing, which is um, there's a group of things, or things that are beamable are in a group called beamable. And so it just gets all the objects in the world that are in that group. It makes sure they're not about to be deleted. You know, they haven't been um, destroyed or something. It's a, you know, they're a valid um, entity in the game. And uh, it loops through all of those things to try to find the, the closest one to the crosshairs. So you can control which one you're going to beam by moving your aiming crosshairs around. And this just does a bunch of, it does a bunch of stuff. It depends on if you're using modern controls, it's WASD and the mouse. So it's wherever the mouse is moving. If you're using the classic controls, it's just the crosshair is always right in front of the ship. So it depends on where you're aiming. And then for classic controls, since you don't have direct control over the aiming, you have to kind of point the ship. 
um, there's a priority. Um, some things have higher priority, like uh, fuel and people have higher priority than asteroids. Uh, so it sets that there. So every tenth of a second, it's just finding the closest thing to the cursor that's going to get beamed, the closest thing that's going to get beamed. And then after you activate the beam, we saw that, then it goes, calls this uh, tractor method. And this, if you send in null, it'll disconnect it. If you send in an object reference, then it'll connect to that object. And this is where it starts the stage one. It um, gets the path to the object checks if that object has an attached to player method. If it does have an attached to player method, it calls it, because some objects will do certain things when they get connected to the tractor beam, and others, I don't care. Shows the tractor beam sprite, does a little animation tween, uh, and it connects a signal so that the tractor beam knows if the object has been destroyed. Uh, then it sets a uh, cooldown timer so that uh, before the tractor beam will work again, and you're off to the races. So now, so now the tractor beam's been attached, and I can show you that real quick. Let me just demonstrate that uh, two-stage business. Uh, let's do this. This is something else I was testing yesterday, but let's put something here that we can beam. So I'll get real close to it. And then you'll see, once I attach to it, we'll be in stage one. And I'll be very close to it. Oh, I can have those though, John. Um, what can we beam? It is not a thingy that's going to go away. It's going to get sucked up like that. Let's just put a reactor in, I guess. So when I get real close to it, see I can kind of move, see I'm going up and down and left and right, the tractor, the reactor's not moving right now, because it hasn't gone rigid yet, it's still, the tractor beam's kind of shrinking, and it grows, and it shrinks, and it grows, and it can move around so slight. Once I get it out to its full length, now it's rigid, and it'll pull, but it'll also push, it won't shrink again. swing things around and then you can push it up. Right? That's stage two. So the way it does that <coughs> is up here in the, I think this is in process. This is in the physics process where like, uh, this would be like fixed process I think in Unity. Um, it just says basically um, if the tractor beam is active and the target of the tractor beam is still viable, it's still in the world and valid, uh, then let's rotate the tractor sprite so that it, it faces and connects to the object that we're beaming. And it changes the scale based on the distance to it. That's how the beam shrinks and grows. And then if the distance to the target is greater than its range, then it does this business here, tractor beam, node B, tractor target. And that makes it rigid. It uses uh, physics stuff. So there's a, uh, there's this, which is a pin joint, okay? And a pin joint uh, you can see it's centered right here on the ship, and it's connected to the ship on one end, and on the other end, it'll be con it's connected to nothing. Um, but what we do is we assign that other side dynamically at runtime, right? And then this pin joint uh, connected to the rigid body, and then connected to the other rigid body just makes everything, it's, it, once you assign both ends of this, it makes it, it makes that whole connection rigid. Uh, so I don't have to do anything to do that really, I just have to assign these nodes and the engine, the physics engine does all the hard work. Thanks Patrick, 
Good luck. Let me turn that volume down for you guys. Um, all right. So to fix this bug, <laughs> what ha what's happening is a person will get beamed up and sometimes they'll just get zapped in so quickly that this never happens. The stage two part never happens. But sometimes, depending on how the numbers get rounded and the frame rate and everything, sometimes it'll be right at that right distance uh, where it does get, where it does happen. And it will, uh, the beam will go rigid and it'll stop the, um, the, the person that you're beaming up or the fuel can or whatever you're trying to beam in. It'll stop it from, from going into the ship. But the, if you look at the person code, what it's doing is it's just trying to fly towards the ship as fast as it can. Right? If the thing is beamed up, it's just gonna, it tries to fly towards the ship at 400 pixels per second. And so you have this rigid body flying towards the ship at 400 pixels per second connected by a rigid connection. So it's just, it just starts pushing the ship across the map and you lose control and you die. Um, so I think what I need to do is just say here, don't do this, don't do stage two. If it's a person or a fuel can, Right? If it's some kind of consumable thing, don't do this stage two part. Um, so I just need an if condition here. If, there we go. If something, then break. Does break do what I think it does? Will it break out of an if? <laughs> Fox Shadow, you haven't seen that before, huh? I think it would have to be something like if. Oh, you know what? What we can do? Uh, we can do. We can put the condition right, just right here. If. Um... <laughs> if not. If uh, not. If attachable and right, so I'll have some variable attachable. So this isn't that's not what I'm going to use. I'll have to replace that with something. But basically saying, if the object that I'm trying to beam up is attachable, um, and I haven't con connected this thing yet, then connect it. But if it's not attachable, it just won't do this part. So I need to figure out some way to change this to false for certain items. And I think any key, you've nailed it, you win the prize. Um, I need to put these consumables into a group. So I have a person, and like I showed you before, he's a beamable, and he's a person, and he's friendly, and I've got uh, fuel pods as well, they have the similar problem. And they're beamable, friendly, and transient is a group I use for things like bullets and stuff that disappear after a little while. Uh, people are persistent, but things like fuel cans and uh, bullets, when you go into the editor, all the transient stuff just gets deleted. Um, I think I need a new group. I want to add like a consumable group, All right? So I'll add fuel pods and people to a consumable. Oh, I'm gonna spell it right. Consumable group, right? So now fuel pods and people are consumable. So now I can say in here in the ship, make attachable true. Then I can say if is if target is in group consumable attachable is false. I think that'll fix it. So now 
anything in this consumable group, this will be false, which means this will never happen. The stage two will never happen. Unfortunately, it's hard to test because uh, I can't make this bug happen at will. Um, but we can try. We can try. I see, I think what I'm going to have to do is just, oops, I'm going to have to uh, just trust in the game gods and uh, hope that this works and the bug reports stop coming in. Let's put some people in. And we'll put some fuel pods in as well. Just make things interesting. So if I get at the maximum range here, so that's when it would happen, right? It would happen at the maximum range. So far it's not happening. So that's good. I mean, that's all positive, right? I can beam stuff. That's still doing its thing, as it should. Let's see how the, like when I'm close to things, it just goes to whatever's closest to the cursor to activate it. Or it activates, it makes the closest thing to the cursor beamable. And even though that code's only checking every tenth of a second, it's it's fast enough for a person not to focus right. Uh, so let me, let me explain this in here. Let's try and get it close. I think that's probably gonna fix it. It looks correct to me, and I can't cause it to happen right now. So that one's okay. That one's okay to attach, right? Because it's not consumable, it's not gonna disappear. And it's not trying to push me around. But these guys they just disappear. I mean, at least I didn't break it. And I think I think it's correct. I just don't want to do stage two if the object is consumable. And that's what this does. So if this is the cause of the bug, and I, I'm certain it is, because the bug wouldn't happen unless it was, unless this node B of the pin joint was attached. So that bug can only happen if node B is attached. And if that can't happen for these consumables anymore, then that bug should never happen again. You know, we were talking about automation the other night, and I just don't know how to automate a game like this. I don't know how to automate the testing for something like this. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Like, how would I, how would I control a gamepad to drive the game? Plus, parts of the game aren't deterministic. Every time you play through, there's going to be some randomness. Asteroids in a different position. Um, and I don't think that the physics engine itself is deterministic either. So even if you've got it automated perfectly, I think you're going to get false positives sometimes just because of the randomness and the non-determinism of it. Uh, anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. If you've got some ideas about how I can drive a gamepad run the code, and then detect when something bad happens. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear it. I've done automated testing before for web apps. I just wrote a bunch of tests yesterday. Um, but it seems easier to like insert keyboard events into a web browser and then look at the HTML and see if it changed correctly than to look at a screen of a game or run a game pad, I, I don't even know. All right, so I think that's fixed. I think that's fixed. Um, and 
I changed this guy. And I changed this guy. And I changed this guy and this guy. And like I said, I like to look at the changes I made just to make sure that I didn't sneak in anything else I didn't intend. So I just added consumable, added consumable, added this variable, and this is probably just some noise. Yeah, I can throw that one away actually. Fix the bug there. People, fuel pods, push the ship. Project Group Manager in Godot. I don't think that there is. That could be handy. That would be handy. Yeah, I mean, right now for stuff like that is, um, I kind of just have a document of stuff like, uh, it would be nice to know also like what are all the different canvas layers I'm using in the game and um, what is on them. But I don't know. I don't, you'd have to have some way of tagging it. They do have something like that for physics layers, right? Collision layers. You can actually name the different collision layers, um, which is super handy. I don't know. It hasn't really come up. I don't use that many groups, and I don't know. I guess it, it hasn't it hasn't affected me really. All right, let's do that. Moving it on over. Fade out level on B mount. Okay, so this one's an interesting one. I got some feedback, not part of the beta test, but just I can't remember who said it. But um, they thought it was weird. Let me play the first one here. They thought it felt strange. And you guys can tell me what you think. That when you when you get this thing, get the reactor, and then you make it to the exit, if there was landscape over here, watch. I'll try and I'll try and do this so that my ship passes through these rocks here. Oh, I should swing this the other way. Come on, a little aerial acrobatics action here. This one can pass some match on. You see how he passed through those those rocks there? It's a minor thing, but it gives some people like a weird thing. Like, why, why can you go through those rocks and keep yourself through it? Yeah. I mean, it's a video game. Why does anything happen? Um, but I did get the comment more than once, right? From more than one person. So I thought it should be interesting. Let's see what we can do about it. Um, and I've already got this cool parallax starfield background. Um, what if I just uh, created a scene with that in it and then on the beam out just popped that in so it's between the uh, ship and all the other objects in the level. Could look cool. So uh, to do that we need a scene and I'm going to add a new scene. We'll call it a I don't know, we'll call it level escape. Level escape scene, and we'll put it. Hmm, where to put it? 
Let's put it in backgrounds. That makes sense. And in that level escape scene, we need um, that whole Starfield thing. And I've already got, I've already got it in another scene. So I'm just going to copy it from there. With the stars. And there's a script that goes with it because if you just if we just start the scene, I think the stars will just be static, so they're not moving. So the way these stars work is they're a material with a shader, and the shader has uh, you know some noise, some noise textures, a star field texture, but it's also got this position uniform. And as you pass in, as you change the values of the uniform of the position it moves the star field in the shader. And I do this by just giving it the camera position every frame. But in the case of what we're doing right here, I just want it to move a certain direction. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna copy this guy. script, copy that, right. so now this is saying um, position starts off at 0, 0, and then every frame it's going to update the position by 150 pixels that way and 20 pixels that way uh, per second, that's what the delta does, right, it makes it per second instead of per frame and then just updates the material with that information. So now when I run the scene, it should move, right? Kind of that way and that way a little bit. But I think I want it to go just straight up. So I want to go like zero and then minus like a thousand. Let's make it go fast, right? And I could even do it faster, I could do how fast can it go? Let's go 10,000, see what happens. Too fast. 10,000. That's too fast, too. 2,000. I don't know, I might have nailed it with the 1,000. Let's try that. <clears throat> And then I want to add a uh, animation player as well, because I want this thing to fade in. So I'm going to add an animation player, add an animation, default, default. That's just a convention I use. I like to name all my animations default, at least the ones I want to play automatically, right? Let's have it be, um, yeah, one second's fine. Let's go with that. And then we'll have it animate the whole node uh, going from fully visible to fully transparent. We'll have it start automatically. And no, 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 that's backwards. We have it go from fully transparent to fully opaque, right? And it'll play to the end and then it'll stop. So we'll see it, right? It won't make any sound though. <laughs> You've got plaid. So this should fade in. Hmm. Why didn't it fade in? Maybe it did, but because, because, <laughs> hey Max, because of the startup time of the scene, it may not be visible. Let's slow it down, we can see. Play back at uh, point 0.2. Yeah, so it's, it's working, it's fading in, right? And then 
becomes fully opaque and you just you just see it it's doing its thing all right so i've got my fade in scene my level exit level escape scene <clears throat> so now when you exit a level, I need to instantiate that scene and put it in the game. Oh, you know what else I need to do is I need to change the Z index of this to nine because my ship and everything is on layer 10. The level and everything is like below 10. It's like, I think the biggest thing I have is like Z index three or something. Um, so nine will show right underneath the player and obscure everything else behind it. So let's see if we can find that level exit code. Exit timer. Here we go. We're getting close. Okay. Exit level timer. So I have this singleton, which has an exit level timer of three seconds. That's how long it takes to escape. Or once you've hit the exit, three seconds, and then it goes to the game over scene. So what starts the exit level timer? There it is. Is that the only thing? So here is where I want to put in that scene. Line 485. So the first thing I want to do is preload that scene. Right there, right? So now I have another escape in um, that whole scene has been preloaded into this variable, right? And then if I go back to uh, that line, I can say, um, um, escape equals level escape dot instance. And then uh, game This is gonna be at the wrong position though. I need to put it at the uh, camera position. So I wanna say escape position equals camera position. And I have, again, this is, game is my, is a singleton that I have, and it just keeps track of a bunch of shit. Um, ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -bum. Yeah, I think that will work. Let's see what happens.
coordinates were wrong, for one. Um, it, they were off by half the width of the screen, so I'm guessing that the camera... The camera... So the camera's origin is at the center. So I can fix that by changing my level escape scene so that the stars also centered at the origin. There's another problem. fade in a little faster. Sure. <laughs> hey man, I'm always surprised when my code works. If you were inside my head and knew how I think, I'd be surprised too. I was, uh, I thought maybe it wouldn't work because there's so many shaders on the screen and they're all screen space shaders. And if you have, um, like, if you have a screen space shader, it's, all, it's not gonna, it doesn't take into account other screen space shaders. Uh, like they overlap and kind of get weird, kind of slightly weird results because of the way the rendering works. Uh, but that works okay. I think I'm going to sit with that and see how I like it. I'm not sure I like it. I'm not positive that I like it. And I think I'm just going to have to sit with it for a couple of days and see if I still like it. It'll either grow on me or it won't. Anybody 
watching uh, games done quick. Just some wacky stuff going on in that Twitch. I mean, really impressive stuff. But like, oh, watch, here's a good one, cause, right? Cause you, yeah, I mean, that works, right? Cause you're like, This is a good example of where the um, the whole going through the walls thing kind of weirds people out. Because, you know, you go up, you get beamed up, but you go right through this wall, right? <clears throat> but now... That's a nice thing about Godot. I mean, it's really easy to make these scenes, right? Scene's very simple. You can test it in isolation. Make sure it does the thing that you want it to do. Um, it's off camera here. Actually, I can move the whole thing. Do that. I'm just gonna snap into the center. Six forty by forty two forty, right? It doesn't look like the middle. It is. Um, so you can test the thing in isolation like this, and then getting it into your game, you just have to remember where your code is. You create an instance of it, you put it to the right position, you add it to the game, and it does its thing. It's like, um, that was easy. It was too easy. That's why I'm suspicious. That's why I'm surprised that it worked, right? I'm like, I'm suspicious. What did I break by adding this code is what I'm wondering. That was too easy. I added three lines of code and that worked? Nah. I broke something else. There's something, it's going to bite me later. I'm going to test it one more time. That transform, so I'll make sure that's working before I commit it. Should be fine because you can move the I move the node around in the editor, but I didn't change the relative transforms, and then I just move that node again programmatically anyway to be in the camera. Yeah, it's fine. Escape, level escape. Um, I changed the Z index of my uh, reactor platforms in the reactor. Um, so that they would appear above that background. Copied some code from here, but I, I kind of wish it wouldn't record this stuff, like what frame, because the animations are playing in the editor, so it's changing this frame number, and it just makes noise every time I go to commit. But I don't need it. Same with this one, don't need it. And right, preloading, and then adding it. That's it. These levels are there's a bunch of noise in here too, because every time I go into the level editor, it just loads things maybe slightly differently than it did before, or the position will change by just a fraction of a pixel. So, uh, yeah, I don't need those changes either. 
it's a little bit annoying, but it's kind of like, it's not so annoying that I care about it really. It doesn't really slow me down. Added, um, level fade out. And then the player escapes. Yeah. You want to take a look at one? So this is an example of one of my levels. Let me load it up in here. Uh, gravity. Let's look at this guy. Well, let's look at an easy one. Well, it doesn't matter. So this is a level file. I put a version in here. I'm not sure why. I think maybe later I'll have um, if I ever change the level editor format or something, or add something weird in here, I'll version it. And then my loading and saving, my loading system can do something different if it's a version one or a version two type of file. But right now everything's just version one. I haven't really changed anything. I haven't released the game yet. Um, it's basically any file. So every, um, there's, a, there's a category here, a section for the global settings of the level. And then there's a section for each entity in the game. They all just get a number. Uh, they have an ID telling me what um, type of entity it is. Uh, it's position, it's rotation, and then whatever special variables that it has that I need to know about. So this one's a gravity well, so I need to know its radius and its gravity strength. Uh, this one's a wall, so I need to know its position, rotation, all the points that make up its polygon and whether it's a background or not. Um, let's see, here's a laser gate, and this one has a position rotation. It's got an ID, uh, and this ID is generated by the system. It's generated by the game, the level editor, automatically. Uh, and it's used as the unique ID that's targeted by signals. So like a button would use this as a reference to this laser gate. Um, it can have its own signals, right, that it can attach to other things, uh, and its own variables here, whether it's open by default, what its phase is, whether it comes on and off, whether it's intermittent or whether it's a steady laser beam. Um, and then all these variables, like if you look at these, these variables here, right, if, you, if we look at the laser gate scene, you'll see I have these exported variables, and I export entity ID, signal open, signal closed, intermittent, and open. Right? And those are the ones that are here. And this is all done by uh, some introspection code. Uh, when you save, yeah. That's all saved by the level editor. So if you go into the level editor, this is my biggest scene. Most, the most code I have is in this level editor. You know, in one in one file. I mean, uh, if you go to save, I'm gonna call that function save level. There it is. So you save a level, you give it a path, right? Um, this is where it's setting that level file version. This is where it sets all those global values, right, in the level entity. So it creates level, this level section, right? Gravity starting fuel name, right? It's all here. Gravity starting fuel name, right? Then it iterates through all the entities, checks if that entity is savable or not. Some entities in the level aren't savable, like asteroids. They're in the level, but they're not savable. They just get generated automatically at playtime. Uh, but things like turrets and walls and all that stuff is savable. So it uh, creates a section for it, right? Entity dash and then a number, right? That's this. And then it saves its ID, position, rotation. If it's a wall, it also saves its polygon. And then it inspects the property list. This is that exported property list in the, in the script itself. So all of these exported variables are just automatically read here from this and it just enumerates them all and saves out those values. And then it goes to the next entity, just saves them all.
then it makes sure it saves it correctly, does a little feedback, uh, either an error message or you know, a nice sound that it, everything's saved correctly, and it's saved. Loading is just the opposite of that. It opens the config file, and then it, um, the level file, and then it um, just starts looking for those sections, right? So it goes, it gets this section, uh, make sure it's there, so it's a valid level file. And then it um, loads in that level section, and then it loads in all the other entities by just looping through all the sections for each section in that file, load it in, so it gets all the values, and then it just goes backwards and creates those entities. Um, it it uh, creates the entity here with the ID, gets a reference to it, and then it sets the position, sets the rotation. If it's a wall, it sets the polygon again. And then it goes through all those um, special exported variables and just resets them, sets them back again. And uh, resets the stats of the game, moves the camera, connects all these signals to everything, and done. How do you handle the buttons that reference a laser? What if the button is loaded first? Uh, that's fine. Yeah, so it, what it does is it, lo it creates all the entities first. First thing it does, it creates all the entities. Then once everything's created, then it connects all the signals. So it doesn't matter what order it loads them in. It just loads them all. Then it connects everything. Yeah. And this connect event triggers is like a second pass. It loops through everything again, looking for signals. And we can look at it. So it loops through all the children in the level, gets those properties of the signal properties, right? So it gets these properties to see what it's connected to. And then it does some decoding here of the signal format. Let me see if I can show you one. I'm sure some of these are connected. There's one. So this is a button. When it's opened, it'll connect to this entity and call its open trigger. Send it the open code. And it'll connect to this entity and send it the open code, this entity and send it the open code, and this entity and send it the open code. So when this button is pressed, it'll contact all four of these entities and send it the open code. And when it's closed, it'll do the opposite, send them all the closed code. So that's what this is doing. It's decoding that data, right? That entity and code data. It decodes it into entity and code and then make sure the signal isn't already connected, and then it actually connects the signal. And signals are something in Godot. I'm sure Unity has something similar. It's just like an event observer pattern. Uh, but it connects the signal to the right entity. It connects the object with the signal to the right entity, um, calls its trigger method, and passes in the code when it happens. And if you look at laser gate, you'll see it has a trigger method. And it takes a code. And when it's open, it opens. And when it's, the code is closed, it closes. So I can add new um, codes by just creating a list, right? Maybe if I want the laser gate to explode, I can add an explode code. And now buttons can target a laser gate and give it the explode code. And then I can make the explode code do something. If code equals explode, then, you know, die, right? Something like that. So I can give new behaviors to things and new variables to things. And I don't have to change the editor code or the save format or anything. It's all just general purpose. It works with whatever I put in here. I can export new variables, right? Uh, I can export a new variable uh, for explodable. And now that'll appear in the editor just automatically.
Um, is there a reason I don't use an enum? Probably not. Probably not a good reason. I mean, one reason is I want to make sure that when you're in the editor, let me bring up the editor. I think if I use the enum, well, I'm not sure. But like, if you have a, uh, if you have a button, right? And then you have a uh, thingy. Okay, let's put a laser gate in. Right, so now I can connect this button. I can connect this open signal to this gate, right? So one thing is I need to be put names here. And I think if I did an enum, I need to actually map the enum value to a name as well. It just seemed overly complicated. I just use a string. I mean, each each method, each uh, object only has um, like one trigger code anyway. Like most of them are just do the thing, activate, right, as the code. And there's only one. Laser gates have two codes, right, open and close. So and I, if I had hundreds of them, maybe, but I've only got two, three, five. It's not that big a deal. And then the signals, this is just a visualization of the connection. That's just using, um, um, I guess in Unity it would be like debug draw, that sort of thing. So that also that too is just in the editor. You know, when you're in edit mode, it enumerates the signals for every object and draws a line. And you'll notice, see how it, it kind of lags a little bit? Because it's, it's only drawing it like once every tenth of a second. Um, because on some big levels, there can be, you know, just hundreds and hundreds of uh, signals. just signals everywhere and all this stuff is all these all these visualization stuff is all debug draw stuff and if I had it drawing in real time the editor would really bog down so tenth of a second is fine right? I mean you don't even notice that that's fine signals see how they're connected that's fine too I'm willing to tolerate that that's fine debug drawing is slow drawing lines on these textures is slow and I think that's partly because um, every time you change the texture it has to re-upload it to the GPU it just takes a long time Uh, I haven't looked into that yet, that bug. Crates on pads not always working with lasers. I I know of the bug. Um, I'm having a hard time reproducing the bug. Um, I know there is an issue where <clears throat> if you're in the editor and you go back and forth between the editor and playing the game with this, that can cause some problems because, uh, like take this guy, right? It's actually activating it in the editor, right? But when you when you switch back and forth between the game and, and the editor, it can get confused sometimes. Um, also, certain things like this guy, uh, this guy has an area 2D attached to it, and this will fall down into the area. This will fall down. And sometimes, um, I don't know why, but sometimes the Area 2D won't detect it. Um, and that could be partly, I mean, I'm just guessing, but I think it, it could be because if it's already in the Area 2D when the game starts, it might not detect it entering the Area 2D. But I've, I've actually tried testing that, and it does detect it a lot of the time. 
most of the time, or at least every time I've tested it. But then I see it happening sometimes just in the wild, right? And I don't know, I don't know why. I mean, it could be a bug in the engine itself, for all I know. Um, but I'm confident that there's gonna be some workaround for it. Uh, I just need to play with it some more and see what I can do to mitigate it. It's probably some code that I wrote that doesn't work right. You know, that's a positive, right? I'm optimistic that that's the problem, that I just wrote some bad code because that would be easy for me to fix. I don't know what on stay is. I think I just want to do it like, like for crates falling on here, I, my, my inclination would be to try and find the bug, right? The root cause of it. But if I can't find the root cause, then what I'll probably do is just write some defensive code in here that counts the crates slightly differently than the way I'm counting them now. Uh, maybe I won't depend on the physics engine to count them entering the area 2D or leaving the area 2D. And instead I'll just do a distance calculation or something like that. Yeah, I mean, some of these things do have a lot of colliders, so it could be something related to that too. I don't know. Games, man, they're not easy to make. <laughs> Understatement. Um, so I did that one, fade out level on B-mount, but I'm not sure I wanna keep it. I'm just gonna let it sit for a little while. We'll see. We'll see how I feel in a few days. Um, I do this a lot. I'll put in a feature, play with it for a little bit, and then later decide, nah, I really don't like it, and then undo it. And that's fine. That's what version control's for. On enter, on exit, and on stay. And what is the meaning of on stay? Is it just... It means it's not moving, or... It's just sitting there. My cargo platforms have uh, where is it? It has an area 2D and has body entered, body exited. It's also got shape entered, shape exited. I'm not sure why they make the distinction. That could be part of my problem too. Mm, I see. You know, there's no on stay. I have, I have, um, I have signals for when another area overlaps this area, and signals for when a physics body enters. Or exits the area, but no equivalent to on stay. But I mean, I've tested this before lots of times um, where, you know, like the crate is outside the area and it doesn't detect it. If the crate is already inside the area, it detects it. And if the crate falls into or leaves the area, it all works, except sometimes it doesn't work. I don't know, it's probably something dumb like um, I'm turning off the collision or something with uh, one of these bodies, or it's in a group. Maybe my crates are in some kind of group. They're beamable. I mean, who knows, maybe it has something to do with the interaction between being beamed. Oh, maybe that's actually it. Do I have an attach? Hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. These are those examples of those functions I was telling you about before. When uh, when the tractor beam attaches to something, it checks the object it's attaching to. And if that object has an attached to player method, it calls it. 
and if it has a detach from player method, it calls it. Uh, the uh, reactor has those um, So in this one, this is the reactor core. When it's beamed to the player, when the player beams it, then the shield and the generator itself, they get the same collision layer as the player itself. Uh, so they become a player-like object from a collision perspective. So that allows your bullets to pass through it. But then when you detach, it gets back its original collision, which is like an enemy collision and you can shoot it again. But my cargo boxes aren't doing anything like that. They're just setting this boolean. And then if that boolean is um, is not set, then it clamps the linear velocity of the cargo boxes so they don't fall So they have a maximum speed when they're falling. But when you're carrying them, they don't have that maximum speed anymore. Hmm. So that's not the bug. Anyway, something to look into for later. Um, I'm going to call it. It's a long day. It's been a long week. Thanks for hanging out with me, Max. And... Um, Yeah, I got my tags right this time. I'm learning how to do this Twitch thing. I'm getting better at it. So hey, everybody. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, remember, go to gravityace.com. Come join the Discord, hang out. Go to Wishlist on Steam or follow the game on itch.io. Tell your friends about it. I'm uh, Come follow me on Twitter and uh, come catch the next live stream. Till then, see you guys around.